You have a psychology degree from oh, yeah. the University of Central Florida? The University of Central Florida. I have a psychology degree, yeah. So how does that translate to comedy? Oh, it doesn't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was, uh, I was um, in Orlando um, working at Disney, and my mom said, you have to get a degree in something. So while I was doing Disney and then doing improv at, at night, that was just, I would go, I would read the book, I would skip the class, I'd take the exam, I'd get a C, and if you get... C's for two years in a row, you have a degree in something, and that's what that is. I don't, I don't remember anything about the classes. I read the book, got my C, and then went and w did comedy in the evenings. And were you even 21 where you could get into these clubs to do stand-up? So we didn't, I never did stand-up in Orlando. It was, this is all improv. Oh, at a, okay. At a Forgive place me. called a Sack Theater, which was a um, local improv community. It's where I met Wayne Brady and a bunch of other people that live out here now. And so we were doing uh, 13 shows a week. We were making a salary as comedians. So the college thing was just to keep my mom happy. I was like, yes, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get a degree in something and then I will go do what I want to do at night. And would you like be sort of burning the candle at both ends, like getting the finishing the oh, yeah. show? Yeah, when, when, you're, when you're in your 20s, you can do four hours of sleep for months on end. <laughs> So it's almost like the Groundlings. It, yeah, That's very similar to the Groundlings. Um, what was unique about it is that uh, there wasn't any competition in Orlando, and it wasn't for the tourists. It wasn't for people going to Disney World. It was in downtown Orlando, so we had the local high schools and the local colleges. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, you could be any age and come in, even though we'd say it was rated PG, PG-13. It was still open to all people. So that um, yeah, was a, a good way to learn doing it that many times a week. And no desire to ever do the stand-up work? Um, occasionally we had a desire for that, but it's, it's, so, uh, it's so awesome to be able to be the writer and the director and the actor of your own thing and creating it on the spot and live. Uh, and you're, you're with the team of people too, so there's support right away that you don't have in stand-up. I mean, in stand-up, if, you, if you're dying, it's just you and you have to go through it. I did it once actually out here in LA just for fun. I was like, oh, I'll, I'll try this thing. And uh, no, <laughs> not for me. Oh, how was it? Like what happened? Um, it started off great. I had, I think I wrote like five or six jokes. It was like a five minute thing. And the first two jokes were great. They went really well and people were laughing like, oh, this is great. And then the next one, nobody, it wasn't that it wasn't funny. They just didn't get it. And then I go, oh, and then I turn, and usually you have your friend here, <laughs> you're doing an improv, and there was nobody around. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I have, oh, God. And then I just lost all confidence. My face turned white, oh. and I just plowed through the last couple jokes, and everyone was just like, huh? <laughs> uh, so I was like, no, no, I, I'm, I like the improv. Do you remember the first time you met Wayne Brady? The first time I met him, no, but I know what it would have been. I mean, it was that sack theater comedy. They were doing a show called Theater Sports, which is a national chain of competitive improv shows. And I was doing a, a show called Comedy Sports. And so, so some of the theater sports people came and saw me do Comedy Sports, and then uh, they brought me over into Theater Sports, which was an upgrade, by the way. Comedy Sports was, at that time, upstairs in a pizza hut for 20 people. And the <laughs> Theater Sports was, you know, 200 seat theater. So they kind of recruited me from that. And, so from there, right away, that was when I would have met him. I don't remember the exact meeting, but started doing shows with him and uh, the other people in that group. Did you see something in him that that really shot? Like, could you tell he was maybe fearless about? Yeah, his no, jokes he had or? a thing that he still has, which is you can't um, like he's best when you push him in a corner. You know, like when you like when you give him an impossible task, he will figure out a way to worm his way out of danger and succeed. And that was always his, his strength. So when we get suggestions from the audience, you know, we'd ask for different work, you know, what is your occupation? What do you like to do? We'd use that to make up the comedy. So occasionally people would yell like impossible, like you're an underwater basket weaver and you can only rhyme and you have an Ir Irish accent and you're four feet tall and, and they'd give him all that. And we're like, there's no way. And he'd pull it off every time. Wow. <laughs> That's his skill. T taking that impossible thing and making it work. What was the worst part about being live? I mean, were there times, because you, you know, there's that whole thing where you're not supposed to laugh and sort of break that, that I don't know, maybe. Uh, you know, so in our shows, we, 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 could, you, we could laugh 
you know, we didn't want it to be a crutch. There, there are some people that in improv will, will laugh at their own things as a kind of as a crutch. Even some professionals do that. But as long as it wasn't that, there was no, no one cared if you laughed on stage or did anything really, as long as it was entertaining to the audience. Were you competitive with Wayne? Um, competitive with him? I don't think so. I never felt like there was a couple of the other guys in the group that I would see at the same auditions sometimes. So I felt occasionally competitive with them, but I didn't feel that way with Wayne. Um, we were we were very much alike, but different. I mean, he musical theater was his thing, and it wasn't mine. And so he had a he had a whole world of stuff that he was really good at that was different than the stuff I did. So I never felt like a direct competition with him. And to his credit, you know, since we've worked with with each other for such a long period of time, he's completely fine when we do our two person show. If I get bigger laughs one night, he's totally fine with it. He's never been jealous. He's never been like, you know, hey, back off. It's it's my show. He's completely supportive of, of um, me being funny in a way that's awesome. What's your advice for other actors or comics that are going up against the same people? I mean, I know of a couple people that have the same names on IMDb and it's been competitive when they see each other. It, I it's mean, awkward. It's, it's competitive because it's competitive if you go into an audition thinking the best person's gonna get the job. And that's never the case. The best person is never the one that gets the job. It's all about what do they need? What type do they need? Do they need someone that's this tall? Does it have to look like the kid they've already hired? Is this guy a friend of the producers? I mean, there's so many variables that is never a meritocracy in auditions, ever, in my 25 years of doing it. Now, there's a level you need to be great to get up into that to be picked from, but there's no the best. And as long as you realize there is no the best, then you can feel less competitive with people that you see all the time. Was that a, a learning experience for you to come to peace with that, knowing that like, yeah, it's well, it not took a, a long fair time. Uh, <laughs> it took a long time because you know you just like ah, oh, they were better than me and they got the part. It's like no, no. I mean they, they may have been better than you, but that's not why they got the part. There's so many reasons that you will never know, and no one calls you and says, hey, th that guy reminded the producer of his best friend from high school, so they hired him. I mean, there's no or some. You know, there's so many different variables. It's ridiculous. Uh, so you just go in, do your best, bring what you bring to it, your special take on it, and then just when, once you're done with that, there's nothing, it's out of your control. What was one of the funniest things that Wayne did in those days that made you laugh? Oh man, you know, we did, we did so many shows, it's hard to remember specific. Same thing with, like, now let's make a deal. People will say, well, what's, a, what's been the craziest costume? And it's like, there's been, we've done like 2,000 shows. Two, 2,000 shows, something like that, hour-long shows, like I can't, it all just blends together <laughs> in my head. One of the funniest things I saw Wayne do, and it wasn't back in that day, but it was later, I think around 2005, we did two years of a residency in Las Vegas. And um, the audience was, was enjoying the show except for one African-American man sitting right in the middle, who was just like this. And so Wayne was, Wayne finally noticed that this guy's not Enjoy not laughing the show. It's like, are you okay, buddy? Are you all right? <laughs> and the guy just kept. So then Wayne walked out, crawled over the front three rows, over to where he was, and put his arm around him. And then our keyboard player, Cat Gray, started playing music, and he's like, started so singing a song about Daddy. All I ever wanted was your approval. And then sang this like song about this was his daddy. He could never get approval. And the audience is dying, and the, the guy finally cracked a smile. <laughs> oh, that was my one of my gosh. favorite. Uh, Wayne moments, seeing him go out there and just take that risk of like, I'm just gonna sit in the man's lap and sing to him until he smiles and, and he, he pull, that's the impossible situation I was telling you about earlier. He can make any situation funny. He can pull out of any, anything where you go, he'll never get out of this alive. He always comes out smelling like a rose. Were Vegas audiences more enthusiastic? You know, a lot of, what I was been so shocked of going to Vegas, he, Recently, is it's people from all over, whereas I think the old Vegas was a different energy. Um, the people, the audiences in Vegas were were, were good. Um, the best audiences ever are going to be in a dirty club with low ceilings and dark, and people are coming in, and it's a late show, and you feel like you're seeing something you're not supposed to see. Like this is a special thing, and tickets are like five bucks, and everyone's 
packed in. Those, those are the best audiences always. Even comedy clubs, when we, do, when we have done improv at comedy clubs, are better audiences than a theatrical setting like Vegas or, or other places, just because of the, the energy and the, the excitement. But the audiences were great in Vegas. How did you come to the decision to move to Los Angeles? I was in Orlando. Um, I'd got my SAG card there doing, for there was a while where Orlando was like, hey, is Orlando gonna be a new up and coming? Nickelodeon made a lot of its programming there. I did um, an episode of Clarissa Explains It All and then I did an episode of Sequest. Got my SAG card and so I was like, well, I'm 25, good time to do it. So got in my car and drove out to LA. I knew one person. A guy named Dee Baker, who is actually a big voiceover artist who's done a lot of uh, the Star Wars stuff, stayed in his apartment um, for a little while, got a one-bedroom studio place, and, and within six months, I booked two commercials, and I haven't had to have a job except for acting since then. And, like, I mean, I'm thinking, so that's the dial-up was around, and they didn't, because it was 95, was it? 95, yeah. 95, okay. And they didn't have actors' access or breakdown services, or did they? No, they had breakdown, but it was faxed every day. Oh, yeah. So if you if you were one of the people that could, you know, there were, it was only supposed to go to agents and managers, but if you were an actor that figured out a group of people and you could pretend you were a manager, every morning this fax would come out with all of the breakdowns, and then you would drive around with your headshots and manila envelopes and either hand them out or mail, mail them out with your Thomas Guide because no one knew how to get anywhere. So there was this book called a Thomas Guide. Just oh, a, I had Just one. a big map. Yeah. I think I still have it in Do the you? closet somewhere. <laughs> I mean, they were expensive too. Oh, These yeah. They weren't cheap. Oh, yeah. And NoHo wasn't NoHo then. Like, no. That was where a lot it of It was, could... oh, no. <laughs> right, right. Pretty much, yeah. When, when the, uh, <clears throat> the improv group from Orlando with Wayne moved out here, we were called the House Full of Honkies. Uh, which was actually funny because Wayne was in it. And when Wayne left and we were still the house full of honkies, it was just weird. Uh, <laughs> but we did shows in North Hollywood at a, during the, at a place called Acapella. And during the day, it was a bizarre flea market type pawn shop. And in the evening, it would turn into a drag club, but for not, not pretty drag people, <laughs> uh, 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 unattractive, scary drag people. Uh, and then there was an hour between when it was a <laughs> store and a drag club where they would do a comedy. And it was all these dirty couches and a poorly lit stage. And that's where we first started doing our shows out in L.A., which was a shock to us because we were used to doing shows for 200 people in this beautiful theater in Orlando. You come to L.A., we're doing shows for 15 people on dirty couches on a creepy stage in North Hollywood. Would someone show up early or late, like someone with a radio looking to pawn it or someone no, that's too early? Oh, okay. No, I think, I think people figured out that there was, and it was a big weird place with caverns and doors and so I, we never had a problem with that. Uh, but it was pretty weird to tell people, yeah, you gotta, you gotta go down Lancashire. Well, hey, I'm on, I'm on, <laughs> well, they were at a payphone in the 90s. <laughs> I'm on Lancashire. No, you gotta go, you gotta keep going way down Lancashire, like way, so. Past Denny's? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I yeah. know that Denny's. Yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> How many acting classes have you attended throughout your career? Um, a handful. Um, the, uh, in Orlando, there were casting directors that would do, um, same as in LA, but you know, workshops where you'd show up and they'd give you a scene to work on and you'd come in and perform it. And it was never a promise of work, but just you being in front of a casting director's eyes during a you know, maybe they're casting something where he needs someone like you and they pull you in. So I've done things like that in Orlando and out here. But as far as classes, not, not, not many, um, not really by choice of not wanting to. I just, I was always busy and always working. So um, I never felt like I had time to do that. Do you think it's easier now for someone to come out here as an actor or comic or, or back in, let's say, 95, 96? Is it easier now or then? I mean, there's different challenges. I think it's probably about the same, probably about as hard. Um, yeah, it's, it's still hard. Not as hard as musicians. I think they have it. Yeah, that's I think true. they have it tougher because my musician friends, um, yeah, there you can be an amazing world class musician and trying to find gigs is tough. And at that time too, well, the the Sunset Strip had sort of died mm -hmm. in, in because grunge came along and so. Yeah. But I just was caught the tail end, and I would see all the flyers, and the bands would walk up and down, and 
Yeah. It was an event, yeah. you know. It's, it's definitely harder now, I think, to make a living as an actor in LA. I don't, I don't think it's any harder to get television and commercial work, but I think that the money you make is much less now than it was in the 90s when I started. Is that because they do buyouts? Um, it has a lot to do with the state of media and what, you know, when it was three big networks and some cable and now internet and non-union commercials and there's, there's so much, there may be more work in general, but it pays much less. What's the most nervous you've been as a performer? The most nervous? Uh, I went and tested for, uh, screen tested for Saturday Night Live and there were five of us and you, they fly you to New York get up on stage, and they, I knew they were gonna tape me, but I didn't realize they were gonna tape me with the actual cameras that they, the big cameras. I mean, it wasn't just like a little video. The camera dude was there with the camera. You're on the monologue stage, and at the table was Tina Fey and Lorne Michaels and two or three other people, and that was so nerve-wracking. Because, you I mean, there's only five people watching you. Even if what you're doing is hilarious and they're laughing, it's not gonna sound like a wall of, of, of laughter. And that year it was uh, Fred Armiston, Will Forte, my good friend Jeff Davis, and another guy that I kind of knew. And all five of us, you know, we were going up the elevator and we we're like, hey man, good luck to you. No, good luck to you. And we were all, you know, you know, just, hey, we're in the same boat together. We're all in the same. And so we would all went in and did our audition. Um, which I thought it went pretty well. And we're walking, we're walking out and all of us are getting into the elevator, uh, thinking, hey, woo, let's, you guys wanna go get a drink? That was crazy, that was scary, let's go get a drink. And right, right as the doors are closing, someone's hand goes, Fred, can you come with us? <laughs> oh no! And we're all like, oh God, could you wait until tomorrow to tell him he got it? <laughs> so we could all bond and have a, a good time. So. But that was super scary. But also that, like I mentioned earlier, um, it's not about who's best. It's about what they need at the time. You know, did they need a six foot two white guy at the time? Did they need, like, it's all about what fits into the cast at that moment. So um, I feel better about that now. But afterwards I was like, oh, I was terrible. I must've been terrible, but I wasn't. Was that another lesson on maybe not getting your hopes up too much? You know, because when you get an opportunity like that, I'm sure you're, it's the, the problem with screen testing for anything in this town and getting your hopes up is you have to sign the contract before you test. So you have to sign a piece of paper that shows you exactly how much money you're gonna make every month and how many years that you sign the deal before you test. Everyone that tests for every sitcom. And every, every sitcom on TV, every show, there's gonna be three or four people that go in for the network test. And before they do, they all go. So you're looking at the money like, oh my God, I can't, I can't have all this money. You have to sign it 10 times and initial on 15 pages and you turn it in and then you audition. So it's, yeah, you shouldn't get your hopes up. You should just do your best. But at the same time, it's like, oh my God, you've seen all the numbers on that piece of paper, just in the back of your mind, like, oh, I could really use all that money. Well, that's where the psychology degree hopefully. Yeah, right. I should have listened. <laughs> yeah. If I'd gotten a B, I would probably have been happier. Well, maybe it. it I don't know. Does it? It just. It, it would be very difficult to see that and then go in and. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah. The test network testing is the scariest thing, and and of all of the ones I've tested for, uh, SNL was the the most scariest. Well, yeah, I think Mark Maron has a thing too where he was oh, yeah. doing something and Lorma, oh yeah, thanks kid, yeah, I'll take, you know, and he was like waiting outside. Mark was bitter about it for years and then he, <laughs> yeah. if you listen, he had Lauren on his podcast and they kind of had a nice, um, uh, what, what's the word? Uh, like reconciliation. Reconciliation, uh -huh. thank you. Well, the, the nice thing is that he's upfront about being bitter. I know some people criticize him for that. I think it's great because he's just pretty much vocalizing what a lot of people think anyway. Oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, I know he's been he's been chastised for that. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> what has your time with Let's Make a Deal taught you about comedy and about life? What has Let's Make a Deal taught me about comedy and life? I had to think about that for a second. Um, well, one thing that Let's Make a Deal has taught me is the pacing of yourself. Because we do three one hour episodes a day, four days a week for four months. We do 175 hour long episodes. And you can't 
when, when you're doing that much TV, you can't be this guy all the time. You can't be, hey, hey everybody, let's have some fun, woo! Like you can't because it just, you're gonna just exhaust the, so you have to learn to like, you know, bring down the energy a little bit, be a little more casual about it, still be funny, but not nearly the same energy I'd have doing Whose Lines anyway, or doing a live show. You just kind of have to, you're on TV every day at the same time. You just have to be engaging, entertaining, but you have to back off a little bit. I, I find. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I've kind of found out. That's interesting. Did someone tell you that, or you just learned, I'm going to burn out after Well, there were two things. I'm like, I, mean, I remember after like the first week of doing it, I was so tired, and I was just like, I was like wait, you can, I can relax into this thing and not have to be... We still have to be on all the time because if you watch the show, it's very improvisational. And Wayne can go, Jonathan, come down here, sing this song with me. So I have to be ready to improvise. And I can't, I'm not trying to be less funny, but I do feel like energy wise, you have to pace it in a way that doesn't exhaust you, but also doesn't exhaust the audience, which is kind of maybe I applied that lesson to a patient man a bit too, with not having too much going on when it's your face for a long period of time. Well, and plus the things that are happening in yeah. Tom's life or, or did happen. Yeah. yeah. He's in this very tough spot. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would probably not have a lot of energy to it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite moment from working on Let's Make a Deal? Favorite moment? I mean, a lot of times, I don't have a single favorite moment because it's been done so many episodes, but when you can tell when somebody really needs a prize. Like, there are people that win cars and... You can tell they probably have a car. They're excited, but they have a car, right? Then there's people that's like, they have been taking the bus for five years and they are not doing well. And to see them win, you know, a car is like a life-changing thing. It's just, you're watching real emotion and you're watching some, that change someone's life. So that's really cool when we can do that. So my husband David has told me I'm not allowed to use the movie Quiz Show anymore in interviews because I keep bringing it up because I love the film. <laughs> sure. But we're going to just make an exception today. Okay. And did you watch the movie? I did. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I often reference Quiz Show because people will find out they're going to be on um, Let's Make a Deal and then they'll find me on Facebook and go, hey, we're going to be on Let's Make a Deal. I made you some cookies. And I'm like, I can't take your cookies. And I can't friend you because if I do friend you, then you come on the show, then there's a path saying we were became friends and and that's I, because of Quiz Show and the FCC and the regulations. Um, if I know you and Wayne picks you, even if I don't pick you, if Wayne picks you and I recognize you, I have to right away go, hey, I, I know them, they can't win. And then you'll sit down. So I, I use Quiz Show all the time. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. good. So As I, a reference. Oh, yeah. see? Like in the movie Quiz Show. That's, yeah, that's when company. the FCC started regulating game shows. Well, there's also the great element of um, sort of the family that sits down to watch these shows. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's still a part of, you know, daily life today. But what, what are your thoughts on that? How it draws people together and they, they, it's almost like they feel like they know... I mean, you could say that about any celebrity, but, but so much so with these game shows. It seems yeah, like. I mean... Game shows are a great family show. I mean, they're, they're in tone and, and content. There's not going to be anything offensive, um, usually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's a, yeah, it's a great way for a family to enjoy it. I mean, we're on during the day, so it's, that's stay-at-home moms and dads and sick kids. <laughs> but we're on during the summer, too, and you know, retirees like the show. So there's, all, there's a whole group of daytime people that are kind of their own audience. And they love it. They love the show. At first it was a little weird because um, right around when Let's Make a Deal was coming on, the soaps were getting canceled. And I think they canceled the soap to put Let's Make a Deal on. So there was a big backlash from some of the daytime people. Still still is. Uh, but the, you know, the soaps just weren't performing, the, those particular ones. So I think we've been forgiven for that. <laughs> Do you remember seeing a Quiz Show when it first came out? Was it 94? So, yeah. It was uh, John Turturro. Yeah. No, good, I do. Yeah. Good movie. Excellent movie. And, and <laughs> a lot of, it's not just the game show component, but also to who has made the hero and who has made, yeah. you know, the truth teller is actually the evil person yeah. in that yeah, yeah. film. It was a great twist. I remember the trailer too. Uh, who is Vasco da Gama? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. 
What's the biggest role you've had in a movie? The biggest role would be uh, A Patient Man, which is a, a recent um, drama thriller um, directed by Kevin Ward that came out this year on iTunes and Apple and Amazon and others. How did you meet Kevin? So Kevin was from Orlando. So we knew a lot of the same people. I'm sure we were, we were talking recently. Like, I'm trying to remember if I met him in Orlando. I think I did once. And then when he moved out here, you know, we'd see each other at parties and we were, we were friendly. I wouldn't say we were friends, but I knew who he was and would say hi at a party and talk for a little bit. Um, I knew his wife a little more, I think, Katie. Um, that's how I, how I met him, as part of the Orlando Mafia, as they call it. <laughs> how did he present you with the script? So Kevin um, <clears throat> was looking for help casting it, and my wife is a casting director. And so they were looking at you know, different ideas for who could play what. The, the guy that played my part in the trailer, um, Kevin made a trailer earlier on with a diff different cast. Um, he wanted to use that guy, Will Bowles is his name, he's a great actor. Uh, he was unavailable, so he's like, oh, maybe I get some help from Leah. So Leah gave him some ideas, and then um, she mentioned to me, he goes, you know, are you interested in this? You, I was like, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll read it. And then I read it, I was like, this is really good, he's gonna make this? Because I knew the budget was super low, and I'm reading the script, and I'm like, I don't see how we can do that for that budget, but. Uh, so she said, okay, I'll put your name in. And so she pitched me with some other people, and he liked the idea. And then my other friend, Ben Rock, who's a feature director, he directed a Alien Raiders, which is a great B-horror movie. <clears throat> He's part of the Blair Witch team. He was the production designer on that. Ben, who I've worked with a bunch, told Kevin, you know, I think Jonathan, you know, I know you know him as funny, but he has a dark side too. I think he'd really help, help, help the project. So because of my wife and because of my friend Ben, I think Kevin was like, all right. So we went and had lunch at um, the Smokehouse <laughs> over in Toluca Lake, and I think I had a steak salad, and he's like, well, let's do it. I'm like, okay. And that was it. And the film shot in Sacramento mm -hmm. or Los Angeles? Sacramento and Los Angeles. Um, all the train scenes were on the real train in Sacramento. Um, and then all, I think almost everything else was in Los Angeles. How was that to film a low budget movie in that part of the state? Because there's such a difference in, if you cross a certain It areas. was great. I mean, the, there were challenges, of course. I mean, they had a permit to shoot on the train but they did not have a permit to tell anyone to get off or to move. Oh, no. <laughs> so that was challenging. Also challenging is every 15 seconds, the train, the audio, you'd hear, the next stop is so-and-so. So in the movie, you'll see these you know, long scenes between myself and Tate Ellington, who plays the other character. And they seem like seamless scenes, but in reality, it's every 10 seconds, we have to stop and back up a line and go, stop, and back up a line and go, oh, someone just got on, now continuity's out, okay, now we have to wait for this person to leave, and they do, back, mm, but the noise, so the combination of the noise of the train, the announcements, and different people getting on in front and in the way of shots made it tough, but uh, he pulled it off. How did people react to you folks filming on the train? Uh, were they interested? Not in really, no? they didn't, just were like, oh, okay. One of the Fun stories about shooting in Sacramento is it was a nighttime scene on their main strip where all the clubs were, and it was a Friday night. I forget the name of the street. And I had to take my bike and get onto uh, the train, and it pulls away. It's near the beginning of the movie, I think, and then again at the end. So Friday night, Sacramento, you know, two cameras, sound guy, you know, little small crew and me, and we're going to get the shot, but there is a police vehicle in the way of what he wants and he doesn't want it's it's in the way so Kevin the director walks up to the cop car knocks on the window goes hey uh, we're making a movie can you guys move oh, like, wow. oh yeah sure oh, and they moved and I was like oh my god would never happen in Los Angeles wow they would take you to jail in Los Angeles if you asked a cop car to move for your movie wow. <laughs> without a permit yeah, no permits by the way how close do you were to the Capitol like the, the actual buildings did, was um, the so I, I'm trying, I don't think we were near the Capitol building much. We were near the downtown, whatever that party club where all the bars are, and you hear the music coming out. I don't, I don't remember where that was. I see. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Interesting. And then you did all of the bike riding scenes here. Here, yeah, the bike. Most of the uh, actually. Anything that was near a train or a train station was probably Sacramento. And then all the bike riding down the streets was here in Los Angeles, in Burbank, and then in downtown for the nighttime stuff. How are you getting yourself in the mindset for Tom? I mean, because he's, he's gone through so much. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, you just, I forget who, who, I think it was John Goodman was being interviewed by one of those, uh, who's, who's the acting guy that's the famous guy with the beard that always... Oh, for the actor's studio, yeah. James Lipton? Maybe it was him or oh. someone was interviewing John Goodman and they, they asked him the same character and like, how do you get into the character? And I think his answer was, I'll pretend like I'm the guy. <laughs> but and at, at first that sounds like a, a joke answer, but in truth, if you pretend like you're somebody and you th keep you start feeling like they would feel, you know what I mean? It's, it starts happening, you start actually feeling like that person. So. The, the simple answer is I just pretend like I'm a guy who's had his wife killed and how horrible is that? And now I'm actually sad and then let's shoot. So that's how it worked for me. And the drudgery of this like corporate job and yeah. the office politics that aren't revealed. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've luckily knock on wood, haven't had to have too many terrible jobs, um, but I have have had some where it's just like, man, when I first came to town, I, I was, a temp and I was just taking checks at a bank and putting them in order for eight hours a day. Oh, 00399 comes before 00251. And I would just, lunch, I don't know anybody. Ding, back, <laughs> just like, so I think I did that for a week, but that was enough for me to go, oh boy, I know what that is. People do that their whole lives. I, I don't know how, <laughs> don't know how. Well, the film captured the great sort of like the monotony of that, like with the alarm and just yeah. kind of like it, not Groundhog Day where you're repeating it, but it, there was a similarity to it. Um, yeah, yeah. Kevin did a real good job at um, communicating that kind of mundane, depressing workspace. And I don't want to give away the ending, but it, it got me. I did not see that ending. Yeah, coming, it's a cool, so. it's a neat twist that people, uh, um, people are surprised when they see that. Yeah, I was. I was very surprised. Sadly, but. Yeah, well, or happily, we don't know. Well, that's true. Away. Yeah, that's true. No, we don't want to, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you take on a serious role? So, there's probably the best answer is something along the lines of um, the, the script was so good and I considered it. But the real answer is I never get to do this. It's like I'm always doing comedy. It's always, all, and, and, it's, and even when I get parts like I've been on, NCIS recently and I had a part on ER and I did a thing in the bucket list and those are all dramas but I realized right when I got to set that I'm kind of the comedy in the drama you know I'm and that's like the, the recent uh, um, uh, Chicago Med that I did it was a guy suffering from panic attacks and he has to have a brain uh, tumor removed and when you have your brain tumor removed they don't put you under you have to be awake because they need to make sure they're not scrambling your brain so I'm like, this is dramatic, this is great. And I booked it and I was so happy. And I go in there and, and I read with Oliver Platt and the director and I read the parts of the panic attack guy and they're laughing. And I go, whoa, no, no, no. And they go, no, 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 you're, you're, yeah, you're the comic relief in this. We have, the other storyline's really dark. So yours is kind of the, I was like, oh man, even when I book a drama, I'm the, I'm the comedy guy. So there's nothing funny in this uh, <laughs> in Patient Man. He's a sad, depressed person that goes after a goal of his. So. Uh, I never have done that, and I, I never had the chance. So I was like, absolutely. I definitely want to try this. Does that happen to you even when you go to the dry cleaner? You're not even trying to be funny, but... Yeah, yeah, and people will, will recognize me from, you know, whose line or let's make a deal, and I'll be like, oh, can I get a couple more? <laughs> like, uh, not a joke, can I have two more half and halves, please? <laughs> hey, 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 no, there's nothing funny, I just want two more half and halves for my coffee. Um, so yeah, but it, I love doing comedy and, and it's my favorite thing still. Uh, but the chance to do this was uh, an opportunity that I don't know if it'll come along again or I had to say yes to it. And the script was great too. Not to belittle Kevin's uh, script, it was great. But those were the reasons. Yeah, it, to go back to Quiz Show, that there is that scene where Ralph Fiennes is in the, the phone booth yeah, making yeah. a call yeah. and the guy, hey, hey, Oh, you too, you know, and like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So it just, you know, I guess that would 
be difficult to have to be that guy all the time when you're, I mean, because people are going to see you. Yeah, I mean, it's not difficult to be that guy all the time. Um, it's great, and I love that I get to do it. But this was an opportunity that just does not come along. I do not audition for dramatic leads in feature films. <laughs> I don't. I just don't. Um, and this was, here you go. Do you want to do it? So the answer is yeah. Yeah, you feel very bad for Tom. I mean, yeah. in many ways. Yeah. You know, won't uh, give away, but yeah, there's a there's a part where, it, it you know they say like just punish your characters. That that is one where yeah, the characters and it's unique. The way it was written too is like he, there's there's guilt involved in things that happened, and then on top of that, different things that are revealed along the way that just are just like oh man, this guy. Right. Yeah. I enjoyed the part where he did the presentation, yeah. because it kind of you, you were like, oh wow, okay, he's gonna. He really doesn't. He's at a very apathetic part in his life, and the, so the scene you're talking about is he has to give a presentation at work, and he's not prepared for it, and he's just gone. Um, that's that was the hardest scene in the movie to do because that exact scene with those exact lines is it would also appear in a comedy. Where the guy shows up and he's like, um, so today we got mm, China. China is big and there's robots and like that's the normal kind of part I wanted to do. So I had to play it in a way that I have never played that kind of scene before. And that was hard to not make it funny. That was the hardest thing to turn down any comic timing or, or tone that I might have. There's still a little funny in there too. And I watch it I'm like, oh God, I was a little, but it was hard. I mean, I don't, I don't think that scene could be acted without a little funny because it's written funny. So, what are you gonna do? What are the rules of improv? The rules of improv, well, you know, yes and everyone talks about. A lot of people know that, but that's really important. You have to agree to someone's idea and then you have to add something to it. You can't just agree to it or everything dies. So, if you say you're a doctor, I go, yes, and I have a foot infection. And then you would go, yes, and here's the medicine. And I go, yes, and. So, it, that is what keeps the scene forward. As soon as someone says no, it ruins it. I'm a doctor. No, you're not. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Scene's over. Um, yes, and is one. Uh, another one is um, uh, don't wimp, is what we used to call it, where you want to have a real emotional response. So if someone walks up and says, oh, there, there's just been a car accident, your response should be, what? Not, oh no, I guess people got hit. Because you'll get a laugh in that second for that, but then the scene's over. Um, so yes and, um, don't wimp. You know, always be committed 100%, which is similar to the last rule. I mean, those are the ones that I, I follow. And then of course, when you get advanced and you're working with people that have been doing improv for years, you can break those rules knowing that they know you're breaking them. So if I want, if I want you to follow me in a scene, we're doing an improv scene, I want you to follow me, I go, don't you follow me, which is my cue to you to know, yeah, well, he wants me to follow me because that's, so you don't yes and my don't, you know what I'm saying? It's, that's advanced level uh, improv stuff. But for most people that are starting or learning, it's yes and everything. So that's that old adage, in order to break the rules, you have to whatever. You, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And once you, once you know the rules, you can play with them. But it takes a long time to get those rules down, to, to be able to listen. What's the formula for good comedy? I think the formula for good comedy is a small room. I think people should be cold and not hot. And they should be in the dark and the, audience sh and the stage should be lit. Doing a comedy show where the audience is lit is terrible. If they're hot, it's terrible. They have to be cold because then it builds up tension and then the laugh makes them let it out more. Um, cold, dark, the more compact and enclosed because the sound bounces off the walls of the laughter better. Um, I'm trying to think what else. People you can trust on stage. You gotta know that you're gonna do something, they're gonna be there for you and not be in it for themselves. Like, I'm gonna get all the laughs. It's like, no, I have to know we're a team. Um, so you have all, the, if all those going, that's, that's my favorite way to do comedy. You can still do a good comedy show in a big theater, or you can still do a good comedy show if people are hot, but if you, if you want all the variables that I like happening at once, it's those. And why dark? Is that because people want to, why People dark? are self-conscious, you know, if, if uh, 
if, if I can see the people around me, it's harder to be vulnerable to laugh than if it's dark, you can't see anyone. Often we'll do um, corporate shows, which are companies will hire comedians to come out and do shows. And in the corporate environment, you have competitive people and they're all lit up and they're all at tables and there's a real challenge of them not <laughs> wanting to laugh, Sorry. like because they think laughing is weakness. And so, you know, sometimes we'll do these big, powerful corporations, I won't say any names, and you can see that they want to laugh, but they're, well, if Mike sees me laugh, he'll think I'm weak, <laughs> and then I won't get the promotion. So um, there are, it, that's why I think to keep it dark, keep them cold, don't let them see each other. Right. We just needed to put some dockers on you, and it would have been perfect. Yeah, you know, right. Casual Friday. And, yeah. Right. No, that was, that's a great... Yeah, we, uh, that's really interesting, and it, it's kind of like a patient man in a way too. Yeah, right? what you're comparing mm -hmm. it to. What's your favorite comedy documentary? You know, like the Joan Rivers. So there's oh, all my these different comedy documentary documentaries about you know booking. Can't ah, boy, I can't remember what my favorite. Jim Carrey. No. I mean, I know I've seen some. I haven't seen enough. Um, my favorite comedians are um, my trifecta of funny is uh, Bob Newhart. Uh, Steve Martin and Dave Letterman. There are other great ones, of course, but those are the three that I, you know, the trifecta. <laughs> right. Very dry, you know. Well, Bob Newhart is, he's the best straight man ever. And he's the only straight man, I think, that got bigger laughs than the um, comedy people around him, right? So think about Seinfeld. Um, he, Jerry Seinfeld is very funny, but Kramer and Ellen and um, Elaine, El Elaine and, and um, Jason Alexander, oh. they would get the bigger laughs because Jerry's kind of the straight guy, and they're like oh, the crazy ones around him. Every sitcom has the anchor, and then the crazy people around that. Are, but Newhart, his deadpan regular man, was so damn funny that he got more laughs as the straight man than all the crazy cast around him. Um, Steve Martin completely changed. Stand up comedy because it was very, you know, Lenny Bruce, suit and a tie, telling, or, or just, or jokes, joke, 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 joke. And he came up and just did absurdism. And it was just crazy and silly and wacky, which is a lot like improv, even though he was a stand up. And then Letterman was just, you know, a genius of uh, just that whole ironic movement of just doing things poorly on purpose, which was just so, so funny. So they all kind of created their own. Uh, thing. Right, and his uh, top 10 lists oh, yeah. were great. But just the way he would do a segment on the show, like a normal hidden camera segment would be someone hiding behind a thing and someone walks up and then you scare them. And that's, his was just, it was just a guy that would walk up to someone and go, hey, do you have the time? And they go, yes. But he goes, look, there's a camera. <laughs> and it was like, wait, what? Just, Anti-comedy almost, it was a complete antithesis to the well-produced comedy bit. And he was doing it and, and smiling while he did it, so that was great. Yeah, and Taxi too, I, Louis was probably, was he more of the straight one around all of the... Yeah, I think so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Do you think that there's regional humor? Oh yes, there is regional humor, absolutely. And it's one of the things we do when we get to a town, first thing we'll say is what's the... Uh, What's the part of town where all the hookers hang out? Because <laughs> there's always a, a town. Know? Yeah. In Orlando, it was called Bithlow, where the rednecks are, the hooker. Where, where's that dumpy part of town? And you just remember that, okay, and then just use it in a scene at some point, and they'll cheer. He, he knows us. He knows us. It's like, no, I just asked somebody what your, what your bad part of town was and just said it. You don't even have to make a joke. You can just say it. Hey, I'm driving over to Bithlow. What? He knows our town. Or you could, it's that, that one that's got the arms folded, mm -hmm. you know, like, what, was the traffic bad coming from Bithlow? You yeah. know, you yeah. can kind of poke fun and use that too. Also, it, it changes over the ages too. I mean, um, I remember doing, a, not long ago, a college show with Wayne. And, you know, we were doing our silly scene and I, I pulled out a gun, like a character in a scene like I would have done a million times. And, the, you know, all right, buddy, give me. And the the gasp from the college kids seeing a fake, it was just doing this. And I was like, oh. I was like, oh, that's so weird. I've been doing this kind of thing for 20 years doing improv when you're a robber or, a, you know, sticking somebody up. And it, they got a, they were uncomfortable with me doing that with my fingers, which was bizarre. 
Interesting. Yeah. So we have to be more, well. You have to know the, you know, you have to play to the room. But the room doesn't just mean the room, it means the country or the state or whatever, whatever's going on. Um, we used to do, we, we used to do a game called Moving People, which we stand completely still. We, we played on Who's Line a bunch too, and we can't move. The audience volunteer has to move us. So we'll, t but now because of the, you know, touching inappropriate, and so now it's like, oh, I don't, I don't know if we can play those games anymore wow. where, you, where you touch people or get touched just because even though you're just trying to be funny, all it takes is one person to say, I was uncomfortable. And then you don't get hired anymore. So, Yeah, and now we have like these safe spaces and everything. Mm -hmm. where, you know, and, and that's great. And don't get me wrong. But I, you know, I think back to you would tune into Howard Stern because yeah. Howard Stern would only give you. Yeah. I mean, you, you weren't going there to get a, an unfiltered, you know, censored. You went there for a reason. Exactly. And, and uh, you yeah, know, I guess we, it's good to in, be inclusive and. Sure. But then at what point are we being too sensitive and then it takes away. Yeah, you know, the, the pendulum jokes. always goes a little too far and then it comes back and it corrects and then it overcorrects. And so it's, you know, it's a constant. You can look at the history of humankind and see that's a pattern and it happens and you mm -hmm. just have to, uh, as a comedian, you have to adjust to it. But with the regional, is, let's say, an uh, East Coast audience going to want a faster, maybe, um, no. Delivery of something? No. no, I don't see that um, East Coast. I mean, we've we've done shows all over too. We've been to Australia maybe eight to ten times. We've been to Europe. We've been Canada. It, it, nothing nothing no. about the pacing changes. Okay, you know. I wasn't sure. California, you could be more Jeff Spicoli like no. or something. And There's the, different words you can and can't say that like. Saying, oh, you're such a spaz here means just <laughs> nothing. Oh, hey, you're a spaz, nothing. And I found out in London, wow, that's like saying the R word about something. They're like, whoa, you can't say that. We, I'd never heard that ever. Oh. Yeah. Right, like knickers. I didn't know that knickers were underwear in, in I guess, oh. certain parts of Europe. Yeah, yeah, and knickers in the 80s were these, like, they don't wear them anymore, but they were, you know, they were a fad. Yeah. You know? And different things. So yeah, I guess you're right, but that's interesting. Yeah. Can you take us back to, was it 1993 for your, it was your first IMDb credit, maybe it wasn't your first job, but is it Clarissa Explains <laughs> It All? What yeah, was Clarissa that Clarissa like? Explains It All. Melissa Joan Hart yes. was the actress. It was a Nickelodeon show, and they, they had two or three Nickelodeon shows that shot in Orlando. And I played um, a couple different roles. I was a pizza guy. Wayne was a pizza guy on the show, too. I had a kind of a recurring bit where a pizza guy would come to the door. So I did a pizza guy and then I was the blind date from hell on Clarissa as well. <laughs> and uh, oh, so gosh, that was 93. So I wanna say three, no, maybe five years ago, 2015, um, a restaurant near my house here in the valley, my wife and son Austin are eating and my son starts choking oh, on, no. on something. My wife's freaking out, oh my God. and. Melissa Joan Hart comes over and helps her get the food out and help save my son. So, oh my God! Um, thanks, Melissa. <laughs> yeah. So it was so weird. It was like, oh, I, I wasn't there, but I, I, and Lee didn't say anything. But it was like, oh, it's so weird. The little girl that I acted with in Orlando, '93, showed up 20 years later to help save my son from choking at a restaurant. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Your sons act as well. They do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my oldest son Chase is 16. He uh, he was uh, on Lethal Weapon, the TV show. He played the young version of Riggs for about 10 episodes, which was awesome for him. And then my other son Austin uh, also acts. He's in a couple projects with Wayne and something for Nintendo. Um, we we do it as parents. We we let them dip their toe into it. So we're not homeschooling them and making them learn like if. They don't want to read for something. No, you don't have to. Do you want to read for that? We keep it very casual, just so they kind of know what it's like in case they want to do that later. But we're, there are some acting people that are put their children, and this, you're 10 years old, and you have a career, and you have a job, and you take it seriously, and goodbye to your childhood. Um, we're not, we don't do that. I think the kids need to be kids for a while. What do you tell them about once they do book a job and, and preparing for that role? Um, I just tell them to have fun, you know, enjoy it. Maybe you'll like it, maybe you want to do it, maybe you won't like it, and you don't want to do it, and that's totally fine too. Oh God, I hope. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, it, was, it was a little weird because my son, Chase, when he did Lethal Weapon, he played 
this young kid and all the flashbacks of the, of the main Riggs character and Lethal Weapon. And a lot of it was an abusive father that would beat him and, you know, punch him. And so it was all this, like, scary stuff. But the actor, whose name I'm spacing on, was so great and so nice to him. And he was, he was amazing. So Chase had a great relationship with him. And so all the scenes were great. And they knew exactly what was happening ahead of time. And my son was never scared and never felt weird about it or anything. But at first, reading the script, I was like, wait, what? The guy knocks him down and punches, punches him 10 times? And, um, mm. But it turned out great. Yeah. And I know you said you want them to sort of be able to choose whether that's the route for them. Yeah. But do you ever talk to them about the between times for most actors? Because that's such a part of... I mean, it's great to be continuously booking work. Yeah, they well, they know from seeing me, you know, how, how, how much time is spent trying to get work as opposed to the actual work, and that's part of the job, too. I had a great, um, uh, I took a commercial class one time from, I'm forgetting his name. I'm so bad at names, man. I'm, I'm the worst mm -hmm. name rememberer. But he said, instead of saying, hey, I booked a job, a, a commercial, and I get paid $10,000, let's say, Instead of saying you got $10,000 for that, take that money and divide it up amongst all the auditions you had to get before you got that. Now pretend like you're only getting 500 bucks for that job. But that means you're getting 500 bucks for every time you go out on an audition, right? So if you do it that way and you look at like the process as the job, then when you get that audition, you have to drive to Santa Monica, it's gonna take an hour to get to, it's like, oh no, I'm, I'm getting 500 bucks. I'm getting paid today. Even though you're not gonna book that one, if you can take that job that you're getting paid for and imagine stretching that money out over the audition process, now you feel like you are actually working every time you're going and getting paid every time you go to an audition. It's a good mental trick, I think. What's the most unprepared you've been for an audition? The mo <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, there was a time in the early 2000s where I was the right age to audition for all of these sitcoms and it would be pilot season and you get four pilot auditions in a day. And it's just like, I can't. This one's 15 pages of sides, this one's eight, this one's 12 and, the, and each of them have, there's all, they're all comedy so there's specific beats and jokes you have to hit them and it's like, I can't. I cannot learn all of this in one or two nights and be good at it. So there were times where I just was like, I'll just go in and I was in the page a lot and you know look up occasionally and obviously didn't book those but there are times when that when that happens one thing I would have done differently then that I do now is I I'll just use a coach every time if I have an audition I, there's plenty of people you can say you could be a friend you don't have to pay for one if you don't want to just say hey can you can you coach me on this because every prof professional sports player has a, a coach or someone that helps them through even though they're the best player in the field, they have a coach that helps them. So I would advise every time you have an audition, get a coach. If it's a friend, that's fine. If it's someone you have some money you want to pay to, do it. It's worth it. Did you ever have a horrible audition where you're like, I can't even wait to leave this room, I've, and then it turned out you got the part? And you were shocked? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. There's, there's, a, there's auditions I've gone in where I've been like, well, I didn't think, yeah, I guess it wasn't okay. And then they say, oh, you got it. I'm like, really? That's Fine, but I've never tanked, and I've tanked auditions, but I've never booked a tanked audition. Never. And you can feel it too when you're just like, oh, you're in the room and you're. Mm -hmm. It's maybe it's like stand up comedy, which I haven't done a lot of, but it's like, you know, you have to keep going and you know you've lost it and you've messed it up and you've lost confidence and you can feel the, your face is hot and they're all squirming and you're like, oh, I got two more pages of this shit. <laughs> you just got to plow through it. I've never bailed, I've never gone, no, I can't, I'm terrible, I quit, bye. Never done that, I've, I've finished every, every audition to the end. So you haven't thrown the sides, it's just no. like they've scattered, like <laughs> no. snowflake. no, okay, no, 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 no. no dramatic thing like that. <laughs> okay. What makes a great story? What makes a great story? Um, I think first you have to be able to identify with the character. Um, and I think there has to, it has to be a journey that you're on them with. And they have to change over time. They have to, you know, evolve over the story, I think. Um, a static character is just not interesting. 
And, you know, just like we talked about the rules of improv, of course there are people that break the rules that make it work. But the only reason they've been able to make their story breaking, story rule breaking work is because they've mastered the art of storytelling, right? So, yeah, identifiable character, um, relatability, changing over the story from being a different person than they were at the beginning. Those are the key ingredients, I think. Um, and then after that, you can add all the, the details and the fun stuff. And you could definitely see that for Tom, that there was an arc to it. Yeah. Tom, Tom was a little hard because... Um, without giving anything away, he gets some counseling. And so the choice was, do I play the counseling? Because there's something else going on in his mind that's not revealed. Do I play the counseling like someone that's actually getting counseling? Or do I play the counseling like Tom, knowing he might be having other plans in the back? So that was weird. It was a hard, like, how, how do I play that? Um, but definitely in The Patient Man, the, the arc of the character is really interesting. and. Also, without giving anything away, by the end of the movie, in his mind, he is satisfied. If you imagine beyond the end of the movie, there are other th things that could happen, but yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring actors or comics? Uh, yes. Um, I would say the most important thing for any actor or comic that wants to get into it is it's all about the network of people. It's all about your friends. Talent doesn't matter. <laughs> you still have to have talent, but I mean, the, the most important thing is that network, which is why you want to come here as young as you can, meet as many people, be as nice as you can to people, do favors, be in their student films, help them out with this, help them move, drive people to the airport, do as many <laughs> favors as you can, never be a dick to anybody. And after 10, 15 years, you'll have this network of people and the people that you play softball with in your 20s, they're gonna be running studios in their 30s and 40s. They're gonna be directing movies. They're gonna be head of casting. So it's just come here, create a network, and nurture that network, and be nice and do favors to everyone all the time. That's, that is what I have figured out after 25, 30 years of this. Do you think it's more so now with social media? Or it's been the same? It's the same. same. Social media makes it easier, I think. You can probably um, expand your circle a little more with social media, but it's still about having that network of people. And, and don't be afraid to ask people for favors too, as long as you're the kind of, like we all know the kind of people that, that just ask you for stuff and they'll never do anything for you. But as long as you're confident that you, when someone says, I need, I need extras for my short film, yes. I need to drive to the airport, yes. Can you read my script and give me notes? Yes. As soon as, as long as you're the person that says yes all the time, then don't be afraid to ask people for things. And then don't be upset when they say no. Sometimes it happens. Uh, that's, that's my advice. That's more important than anything else, than the talent, than the agent you have, than the projects. It's the people. Have you thought about if you had come out in, let's say, 2006 as a 25-year-old and how you would have created your own like web series or, you know, I mean... To have something like YouTube or Vimeo at your fingertips at that age. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a neat thing that kids have now. And uh, I think I, I, myself and the comedy group I was in probably would have been doing, you know, YouTube videos and YouTube sketches because there's a way for your stuff to get seen. So that's... But that being said, I still know people who still think in the old system. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I have an agent or manager. I don't need to be doing that. Agents and managers will never get you work. They won't do it. They're there for when stuff that you have created and work, they can help bring it to the next level, right? But, and yeah, occasionally you'll get an audition or two from an agent or man, hey, I, I pitch you for this and you'll go and you'll audition. But that is, that should just be in the back of your mind. You should not look at them as the people that are gonna get you your career. You need to make your own career happen all the time. Whether that be YouTube or writing a play, making a short film, whatever. Just get out there and make stuff and do it. If it starts to take off, that's when they're great, especially managers to like, oh, I can grab this thing and I can, why don't we pitch this to so-and-so over here? Sure. But just sitting back and like, well, they're going to call me and when they call me, I'll go in and I'll get in and then they'll have a career. It's like, no, do not. Don't do that because they, they just, they, 
this thing about agents and managers, and I have many friends who are, and I have agents and managers, and they're all really nice people, but they have a lot of clients, and they cannot possibly be thinking about all the clients all the time, right? They're gonna think about the top 10 or 20%, which is whoever's at the time bringing in the most money. So you want to be making things, be creating things, you wanna stay on their radar, uh, so that when they do call, you have stuff. Has that been your mentality all along? Has it been my mentality since day one? No, no, it took a while to learn that. I sat around often like, well, I guess my agent's not calling today. You know, it's like, you can't, you can't. They're, they're, they are a tool and it's a great lottery ticket to have with your agent. That can't be, that can't be it. You have to make things. And even if it's not content you're making, you have to, you know, Instagram, you have to tweet, you have to let people know who you are, here's my website, go check out my, you have to market yourself. And going back to when you had the fax paper yeah. for, with breakdown services information on that, maybe all the time that you spent driving around finding parking and doing all that now can be spent online yeah. doing that type of marketing. Absolutely. For someone who's new. Yeah. 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 Right. And the Thomas Guide, are they still around? I can't be. Oh, <laughs> it, was, it, it was a cool book. Yeah, yours I know. Is the my, last I still have. Existing one. 